Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Double Guan. Uh, I think uh, while well, we are waiting for more people to join us, maybe let me just get slowly started. Uh, very, uh, very much welcome everyone to come to this um, uh, this uh, keynote speech. Uh, it's going to be presented by Dr. Xi Liang, and uh, the um, yeah. So we 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 have a quite a uh, still have a people coming in. Uh, maybe I give you one just wait one more minute and so then we can start by introduce uh, Dr. Xi Liang first. Let's just uh, get a few more, uh, just one more minute. Okay, everyone. So uh, let's uh, slowly get started. Um, uh, again, my name is Double Guan. I'm a professor at the uh, the Bali School of Construction and Project Management. I'm a climate change economist, and today we are very um, very glad to have uh, Dr. Xi Liang with us and to to present uh, his recent research on the climate change uh, investment and finance. Um, please let me know, let, let me uh, briefly introduce Dr. Xi Liang. Uh, Xi Liang is uh, an ordinary professor for UCL, and uh, he's also a co-director at the Center of Business and Climate Change at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, he also directs the, uh, our UCL's climate investment and finance platform for ecological civilization development. Um, she actually got his PhD in Cambridge, and this is where we met. And uh, she got the PhD in the energy policy and the climate finance. He has uh, published uh, over 40 uh, academic papers and uh, you know, about uh, more than a couple of dozen of reports related to uh, carbon capture and uh, utilization uh, and storage. Uh, and then you know, related to that on the climate finance and the investment. Um, he actually uh, very active over the last about uh, 15 years in this uh, promoting low carbon technology development and uh, uh, spillovers between the UK and China. Uh, he co-founded the, the very flagship, the UK-China collaboration project on this is called the CCUS Center, uh, which is the, uh, the flagship um, project between the uh, UK uh, and the Chinese government. Um, so this um, this uh, center actually has this uh, uh, energy uh, engineering cooperation. Uh, you know, this is quite a number of um, uh, different organizations in, uh, get engaged. He also co-founded this uh, Reduce Carbon Limited, uh, which is um, um, uh, you know a sub uh, subsidiary of a Chinese uh, research uh, resources power. She was um, doing a lot on the micro level economics and finance uh, study, uh, focused on the uh, climate change side. He's a standing uh, committee member for China's Climate Investment and Finance Association and deputy director of the Chinese CCUS uh, committee. So he has a lot of uh, different uh, titles and he has been a really, uh, really uh, productive and a hardworking uh, researcher. And uh, yes, today, so let's uh, welcome uh, Dr. Xi Liang uh, to present his recent work on climate finance and investment. Okay, Xi, it's, um, it's your, if you share your 
your screen and uh, and then the slides that would be great and before you go please let me uh, just say uh, something uh, to the audience we got uh, quite a lot of people joining us today if you uh, don't mind please uh, use a question and answer button to type your questions so you can type your questions anytime but we will answer I mean we will ask arrange the uh, Dr. Xiliang to answer those questions in the end of his uh, presentation so please um, try not to use the chat function but use the question and answer function uh, to raise your questions in that case we can trace the um, uh, the uh, the you know the question whether it be answered or not um, okay, so um, here we go. So Xi Xiliang, maybe you you can uh, unmute and then, and then then to start your your talk. Uh, thanks, Davo. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Yes, I can hear yeah, you. Yeah. We can see you. Uh, yeah. So good. that's good. So I'm really delighted to make the presentation for this guest lecture on uh, emerging issues in climate investment and finance in China. And thanks to the invitation by Butler School of Construction and Project Management, and thanks to Dimers in Y, and also thanks to Dabo's chairing this event. So I'm going to uh, cover quite a number of issues, but it's not going to be uh, in very depth. But uh, I will first give you an introduction about the policy background of climate change in China, and then. Uh, briefly talk about what's the definition of climate investment and finance concept in China. And there are six emerging issues uh, we could briefly cover today. And then at the end, I will give you share uh, the latest development of climate investment and finance practice and the development in China. So in terms of background, uh, I started to work on uh, climate change issue since 2005 and it's now the best time over the last 15 years because all three major economy, China, Europe, and the US are all on board to tackle climate change and use a more ambitious target to address climate change issue. So on 22nd of September last year, uh, President of China Xi Jinping announced the target to peak carbon emissions before 2030. So is a more ambitious target because originally it talked about peaking carbon emissions uh, 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 around 2030s. And uh, there's another more ambitious target is to achieve carbon neutrality by 2060. Uh, so carbon neutrality is a very ambitious target for China because China is still a developing country with a GDP per capita is about one fourth of the United Kingdom and to achieve the carbon neutrality while sustaining the economic growth is a, a tough challenge. And at the same time, uh, a year ago, uh, I think EU also announced a carbon neutrality by 2050, uh, and the EU is also has some plans to in, to impose border carbon tax, which may have some wider impacts to uh, global uh, climate mitigation efforts. And uh, we are also quite lucky to see in the US, uh, the Biden's wins election, but also got both Senate and the con uh, Congress. So, uh, the, and he has also announced a plan to make US carbon neutral by 2050, although it's not yet been, uh, been, been, been rectified by the, uh, the Congress, but uh, hopefully it, it can come through. And the Biden also rejoined Paris Agreement and the issue and executive orders on climate change yesterday, these are all very promising. So, um, so I always said the same thing in China. So although China said it allows to peak carbon emission before 2030 and the carbon neutrality by 2060, I, my, my uh, perception is it is likely all countries in the world have, will reach carbon neutrality much, much faster than we saw because uh, many all, when these all three major economy are on board for climate change, then we will have a good chance. Uh, the target will be, become more ambitious uh, in the next five years. So we can't imagine this could happen five years ago. And now, uh, if we include the U.S. and about two thirds of global greenhouse gas emissions 
has uh, been uh, related region has committed to carbon neutrality targets for some time. So a majority of carbon emissions, uh, uh, um, the government has been uh, has allowed to remove has, uh, and to achieve carbon neutrals. So investment and finance is a quite important uh, mechanism to tackle climate change issue. And China started to plan for its climate investment and finance initiative since 2016. And uh, and the last year, and in 2019, and, and the government accelerated the progress and uh, uh, launched various of initiative. And uh, last year, on the 20th of October, the first policy document issued by Chinese government after the president announced carbon neutrality is to uh, propose uh, climate investment and finance, which is a guidance document issued by Ministry of Ecology and Environment, National Development and Reform Commission, uh, China, uh, China Security Commission, um, and, and also the China's Banking and Regulatory Commission. So in the document, it first defined climate investment and finance. So compared to most of terms we use in the West, we call it climate finance. And in China, it includes investment. So corporate activity in investing in uh, climate change and risk management, as well as financial institutes activities, uh, they are uh, we've both, been, both been tackled. So climate investment and finance related to finance activity to support national determined contribution target in the Chinese context. And, uh, and the, it also clarify the difference between climate investment and finance and the green finance. Uh, climate investment and finance is an integrated part of the green finance and it covers both mitigation, climate mitigation, such as uh, uh, adjusting industry structure, uh, ch changing to more renewables and as well as uh, carbon capture and storage, as well as climate ad adaptation. So adaptation is also part of the um, program. And I will give you more information later on. And uh, coming back to slightly more uh, academic context. Uh, so the first issue I want to say is the climate finance funding gap. So the, the reason we work on climate finance in the uh, last few years in China, and I, I'm lucky to be one of the panel expert members to supporting Chinese government's work. Uh, the reason behind this is because there's a significant funding gap to for climate finance. And there are various of estimate for funding need. For example, IPCC suggests uh, 1.6 trillion, IEA suggests 2.5 trillion needs per year, McKinsey suggests 5.9 trillion. So the, these are all be, large number and we know there's a funding gap and estimate by climate policy initiative in Germany suggests the uh, funding uh, every year's finance, climate finance flow is about, uh, 500, about 500 billion, so significantly lower than the estimated funding need. So this, there are all these big numbers uh, we talk about here, but in reality, uh, there is always, um, misunderstanding on what does climate finance funding means. So in statistics, we try to put grants, public climate finance support, commercial finance support together uh, to make up this number and people care about this number, politicians concern this large number. But in reality, we don't know how much emission reduction has been made by climate funding and how much additional efforts and uh, climate mitigation effort has been achieved by this climate funding needs. So a very interesting study uh, uh, by Oxifan, a UK not-for-profit institute has uh, uh, suggested rich countries are not delivering uh, the 100 billion climate finance promise uh, agreed in 2009. And they also suggest a majority of climate finance in the statistic uh, actually their commercial climate finance without creating significant additional benefit. So a lot of this finance are just commercial terms loans. Um, so this could happen uh, without any uh, intervention. So, re the, so therefore it's quite important to uh, make a statistic of different types of climate finance, how much ground, how much loan, how much commercial loan, how much concessional loan, 
how much commercial bond, how much other concessional type of finance, and assess their uh, effectiveness and additionality. So uh, my first point here is in climate finance, we can't just take the lumber, the big lumber, uh, to suggest what will be the climate finance need. It's perhaps more important, we need to tackle different forms of climate finance and affect, uh, assess their effectiveness. So perhaps a uh, researcher attending the um, seminar here today can think about an issue and try to do some things. And, in, and the climate finance is a part of green finance. In the last seven years, uh, we witnessed a very significant growth of green projects around the world and green finance projects. So, so the, the Bloomberg every year makes statistics and it seems like from 2013 to 2020, the issuance of uh, social and sustainable bond has been growing dramatically by a very high uh, growth rate. And the, internationally, there have already been a number of major green finance standards, such as ICMA's uh, green bond principles uh, in the UK's climate bond standard, uh, and uh, also those issued by uh, Financial Service Institute and the issued by government. So China has a green loan guidance and has the latest green bond guidance in uh, 2020. And the EU also has its green bond standard. It looks like this green finance related standard are quite established in the world, but actually behind those very significant growth of green bond, uh, there are a number of issues. So um, one of my uh, master's students have conducted a study together to look at uh, the additionality and the yield discount of green bond. Um, so in reality, when we assess green bond compared to green bond and the equivalent long green bond, there's no tangible financial benefit for issuers of green bond. So the yield discount is extremely uh, insignificant. And, and uh, so in, in other words, it means uh, uh, issue, issue a green bond, it doesn't generate any additional uh, benefit. It doesn't lower the cost of financing. It's just simply put the green bonds on uh, labels on, on investment that already taken place, investment decisions already been made. So, uh, a, a couple of years ago, when I returned to Edinburgh in August, my labor asked me uh, quite excitingly, and she bought uh, 100,000 pounds of green bond issued by Barclays. And I was going to, and he, and she saw she already contributed to emission reduction. But I was going to ask her, uh, what is additional emission reduction benefit created by your green bond? Uh, but it seems the question is doesn't is not quite polite and uh, try to keep good relationship with labor. So I didn't ask ultimately. So uh, the question is quite important, but there was lack of awareness in the financial service sector to tackle. So like this gentleman uh, is a cartoon uh, uh, written by Financial Times in published by Financial Times in 2015. And this man believed he bought green bond and he already contributed to emission reduction can travel uh, travel around the world. So uh, the, so if you look at the green finance standard we just listed earlier uh, in the earlier slides, and actually there is very few green bond, green finance standard discuss about uh, additional climate benefit additionality, including a Chinese green bond standard and they don't and no green finance standard assess what will be the additional uh, real additionality uh, brought by this financial product and of course and they didn't disclose this issue so uh, this is a major issue uh, limitation of green fi finance so investor by investing in green bond may be misled and they may believe they already contribute to emission reduction but in reality it's not their purchase behavior contribute to emission reduction. And uh, another study uh, recently by the Bank of International Settlement based in Switzerland, and they find actually green bond issuer compared to other firm doesn't have better emission, uh, emission uh, uh, performance. So, so they make a statistic based on scope one direct emission, 
scope one and two energy related direct emission and uh, indirect emission and uh, direct emission as well as scope three emissions. So uh, the carbon intensity of green bond issuer uh, ch change uh, after the issuing process, uh, it doesn't actually shows it issuing green bond will help issuers in reduce carbon intensity. So this is uh, apart from additionality, this is another issue that need to be tackled um, because every large bank will have green assets. They can issue green bond, but it doesn't mean it make these banks or related firms uh, uh, have a lower carbon footprint. So it's important to tackle additionalities and additionality is can be referred to proposed activity is additional if recognized policy interventions are deemed to be causing the activity to take place. So if the green bond is additional without being certified green bond, the financial activity will not take place, then we can call the green bond is additional. So that's green loan and other assets. So in the additional assessment process on the right hand side, there is a additional uh, additionality assessment uh, who was made for clean development projects uh, for more than 20 years. But in reality, a majority, a great majority of CDM project, their additionality is fake. So uh, in the last couple of years, uh, my team working with uh, DABO and the CIECC's team actually look at climate investment and finance standard. And our research suggests we uh, the additionality assessment should not focus on single projects and should focus on regional and the type of project. So for example, we can have an overall assessment on uh, whether the solar PV projects in Guangdong province in China is additional uh, rather than focus on individual project to uh, reduce this uh, chance of fake additionality, but still it's quite important to uh, assess. And, it, it, and the, Looking back to the uh, finance activity of green project in the past, and there was a project funded by Ministry of Ecology and Environment in China to study, uh, uh, to make some case study of existing climate finance project. So for example, the first offshore wind project um, uh, uh, developed by Shen Energy in Shanghai Lingang, uh, which is clearly has very high climate benefit and it, it looks additional and a, a lot of banks uh, take a much lower uh, interest rate, favorable interest rate to support the projects. So to, although you, you can see the internal rate of return of the project is quite low and it still can take place because of uh, the, the strong additionality that convinces these banks to support this project. So this is one of the example we are doing. Uh, and, and actually we have a report of a major uh, uh, represented case of climate finance, you can download on internet, including uh, renewable energy storage, low carbon building, and uh, and other climate adaptation projects. So the second uh, emerging issue in climate investment and finance, and climate finance or green finance, whatever name it call, shall focus on creating real additional climate benefits. So without creating real additional climate benefit, it wastes public sector's money, wastes uh, climate friendly investors' time. It's a nonsense, but uh, uh, I think these activities are taking place everywhere around the world. And uh, and uh, so with additionality, uh, I hope we can have a second read of potential climate finance instrument and the class classify impact and versus statistic. So for those, uh, uh, climate bonds without additionality, we can still do the statistic, but that's statistic and it, it should not justify any public finance support. Otherwise, it will waste taxpayers' money uh, to put on climate change. So uh, we suggest for climate bond, climate loan, climate fund, climate ABS, and climate finance, carbon finance border should all be uh, classify as a statistic, which doesn't have additionality and uh, uh, impact so like climate impact bond, clearly it will have additionalities. And for uh, climate finance products or projects with additionality and clearly to make it happen and it needs uh, incentive mechanism to make a difference. So incentive source can come from climate friendly investors or can come from climate friendly commercial banks. 
like Xinye banks in China are a very strong climate friendly commercial bank. Uh, sorry, it's called industrial bank uh, in English. And climate friendly investors such as Bill Gates, and they they uh, they put money in cl uh, for climate friendly uh, activity to but accept a lo much lower rate of return. And policy finance institutes such as China Development Bank, European Investment Bank, or multinational institute like the World Bank, ADB, governments, uh, and these are a potential incentive source for uh, climate finance instrument. And, and and I think European Commission has also looked at how to lower the yield curve for climate bond and debt. These are potential incentive source. While we are formulating potential incentive for climate finance, there are a number of issues need to be tackled. First is what projects or assets should be prioritized. Should we prioritize projects uh, with higher additionality, higher mitigation benefit, higher uh, technologies uh, 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 developments? So in, in China, and while the climate investment and finance works are taking place, I strongly recommend the governments to prioritize those projects uh, with cutting edge technology, with potential to achieve cost reduction, with high social benefit, and rather than try to uh, uh, support every project. And obviously, if climate finance, public support, supporting those initiatives already commercially uh, 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 available, uh, then uh, then public money will crowd out private sector's money, it will be a nightmare. And secondly, what's the right level of support to avoid windfall profits? Uh, because climate finance is very limited. So with a limited amount of money, how to maximize the effectiveness of, uh, of climate mitigation. And, and obviously we suggest to uh, classify climate in impact in, in uh, a born with additionality versus climate friendly born, which it, which is just a statistics to address the issues. And there are other possibility to introduce uh, uh, incentive for climate finance assets. So my team members are looking at whether banks can limit capacity to borrow. Bank with limit capacity to borrow, they can uh, prioritize. Uh, uh, climate finance assets with higher additionalities. Uh, so existing study already suggests the credit quality of green loan is generally better than average, and uh, and uh, 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 and it will need to prove whether there's a need for different projects. So the, my question here is uh, whether the risk capital way for climate friendly projects can be reduced. So if the banks are going to deal with climate friendly investment, they can have a higher capacity to provide loan. And the second question is whether the risk capital weight for high emissions and vulnerable assets will be increased. So in that case, bank will be restricted to provide finance for coal-fired power plant for coal mining activity. So by changing the uh, risk factor without putting public money, it can incentivize uh, climate finance activities. So the, the second issue need to be tackled is to properly coordinate climate finance related incentive. And that's uh, one of the climate finance products uh, people uh, are putting focus on is the carbon market. And China is launching the national ETS this year. And we should start from its power sector. With the emission trading scheme launched in China, China is going to host the largest emission trading scheme in the world with annual uh, allowance reach about 3 billion tons. And with the ETS, uh, climate finance also covers uh, carbon allowance and CCER certified emission reductions related derivative such as futures, forwards, options, and the swap. Uh, so these are potential scope for climate carbon finance in China and uh, in, in the future carbon allowance or CCER can be asset class as a collateral in the bank for uh, to get uh, that, that finance. However, uh, high carbon price doesn't mean more ambitious climate commitment. And this, this, this is an impact assessment report 
issued by the European Commission in 2014. And in the study suggested, for, so for example, this greenhouse gas 40 scenario in the middle uh, with 40% absolute emission cut compared to 1990 uh, in 2030. So for this 40% emission cut uh, scenario, with a binding renewable target and binding energy efficiency saving target for member states, uh, sorry, without binding targets uh, here, uh, the EU ETS price can reach 53 euro per ton CO2. Uh, so this 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 column is a, the the uh, scenario without binding target. But if you introduce a mandate energy efficiency target and a mandate renewable target. Uh, for member state, the carbon price will will be reduced to only fourteen euro. It will be sorry eleven euro. It will be much lower. So for the same amount of uh, carbon emission target, the carbon price can be very different. It can be fifty three euro or it can be eleven euro. So it really de depends on how you structure the climate policy support. So carbon price in the carbon market to some extent without good understanding of climate commitment uh, and the climate policy without a good understanding about the structure of climate policy is meaningless. So uh, the uh, a colleague from Shell have given us uh, some uh, interesting reasons for why the carbon market uh, cannot deliver the carbon price uh, we expect because of there are all other potential policy incentive outside of the carbon market they have already achieved a uh, uh, certain emission reduction here, and that makes the uh, uh, emission mitigation abatement cost shift to the right, and the, the visible carbon allowance price will be much lower than the actual carbon allowance price. Because uh, so in that case, if China is going to launch a portfolio of climate policy, such as a very much stronger energy efficiency mandate to stop approving new coal-fired power plant and to have a higher support for electricity vehicle. So I personally will not expect the carbon market's price will be very high, but all the other policy can be translated into carbon pricing. So policy certainty and the effectively price discovery mechanism are required in developed carbon finance product associated with ETS. This is a, a fourth issue need to be tackled. And we talk about uh, carbon finance derivatives such as carbon uh, allowance related future, carbon allowance related options. And this carbon finance derivative, you have some financial leverage, which will have a higher risk than uh, uh, other, uh, uh, than just allowance and the, and the CCR. So in that case, if the policy without uh, environment in China doesn't have good uncertain certainty, then the fluctuation of carbon allowance price could make investors uh, uh, exposed to very significant risk. So in advance of developing carbon finance derivative, you need to create a very certain climate, energy, and environment policy frameworks. Otherwise, even China may increase the uh, climate ambitious target, climate ambitious emission reduction target, but while at the same time there's a much more uh, rigorous uh, parallel climate policy being uh, released, it could also uh, it could lower the carbon price. So you need to understand uh, how different policy they work together to affecting uh, uh, carbon price in the ETS. Uh, so climate investment and finance also need to tackle the risk management, the climate risk issue. So the Bank of England, the central bank in the UK has defined transition risk and the physical risk back to in 2017. So transition risk refers to firms uh, with higher uh, climate, uh, climate, climate carbon emission exposure may suffer huge, uh, large financial loss when the carbon price or regulation on a uh, 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 carbon emission become uh, stronger, such, such as coal-fired power plants. And the physical risk re re refer to uh, the physical extreme weather event and the physical assets may be affected. So all, both risks can affect the financial stability and can affect the, uh, uh, the stock price of, uh, of the firms. 
So in this context, uh, set up the right level of internal carbon price is quite important. Uh, and in this field, China is behind uh, EU and the US in set up the long-term carbon price, in particular for large firms like uh, large oil company, large power plant, they still don't have a good understanding on what will be the carbon price by in 2030 or in 2040. So without the appropriate long-term internal carbon price, it will be very difficult for them to just rely on the short-term pilot national carbon market. The price signal is not strong enough. And the, clearly the message is carbon market doesn't tell the long-term carbon price. And another uh, dimension uh, on climate risk management is uh, information disclosure because it will help investor to understand what will be the carbon uh, climate risk exposures. So uh, in Hong Kong, China, and in the ESG reporting guide, uh, carbon uh, climate information disclosure already become mandatory. So scope one and scope two emissions, direct emissions and energy related direct emissions is compulsory to, to uh, disclose, uh, which is a very good start for uh, climate information in disclosure. I would expect mainland China to follow in the next five years. So in the uh, climate information uh, dis disclosures, uh, uh, industry are encouraged to tackle scope one, two, and three emissions. Uh, for scope one and two emission, it has very robust and very clear methods to calculate. But for scope three emission, it still doesn't have a, a very a good data system to support an accurate calculation of scope three emissions. Uh, so the issue five I want to highlight here is internal carbon price. The long-term carbon price is critical in addressing long-term climate transition risk. And uh, and the, the sixth issue is uh, talk about China's uh, climate goal, which is a peaking carbon emission and the carbon neutrals. So I have given many guest lectures for Chinese cities in the last uh, last few months, and the uh, they are interesting on what will be potential strategic to reach uh, peaking of carbon emission and carbon neutral in the longer term. So the, I always ask this question, what does peaking carbon emission and carbon neutral means? So some cities suggest, oh, I can keep all the industry, heavy industry and the uh, industry with carbon emission out of the city and only only and only keep financial service, education, high tech industry in the city, and the purchase renewable from uh, from uh, uh, from plants outside of the city, and us as uh, mandatory have electricity uh, vehicle and electricity use in the city. Then in that case, uh, we can achieve carbon neutral. But this is completely wrong, because uh, carbon emissions and the carbon neutral also need to tackle indirect emissions. So if China kick off the industry, heavy polluted industry to uh, other country, move to Latin America or Africa, and China still need to purchase goods being manufactured by uh, industry in, in, in those countries with high emission footprint. So uh, when we talk about peaking carbon emission and carbon neutral, I wish in the longer term it can tackle uh, scope one, two, and three emissions. So indirect emissions need to be tackled, including consumers emissions. Uh, that, that will mean a real carbon neutral and the real peaking of carbon emission. So simply shifting industry to other country uh, doesn't, is not a good way to, uh, to assess uh, peaking of carbon emissions. So in this context behind uh, the, uh, the, the logic is need to develop robust standard to assess scope three emissions and also need to pilot data system to support scope three emission assessment. And, and uh, in, the, in China, because the data system can be mandated by the government. So in COVID-19, we, we can see the advantage of Chinese system to collect data from every resident to control the virus. But in the West, the data system, so your travel information, your uh, vehicle information, your home uh, energy data may not be easily be shared to a central system. But I believe a central system to collect emission data of products of consumer behavior is important to support scope three emission assessment to 
achieve a real carbon neutrality in the longer term. So uh, before we finish, let me spend five minutes to introduce China's uh, uh, climate investment and finance policy frameworks. So I'm glad in the last three years to be part of the uh, expert team to work with a number of experts to help uh, drafting this document. Uh, so this is a high level document that will guide China to kick off climate investment and finance policy and activity in the country. So the document has five aspects and 15 measures, including a policy system, climate investment and finance standards, and how to set up climate related fund and capital to encourage private and foreign capital to flow into this field and to support local practice for climate investment and finance and strengthen international collaboration. And obviously uh, UCL can be a central to help facilitate international collaboration. So uh, I, because of time constraints, so I won't uh, introduce the detail here, but there, will, there are available uh, English version uh, can be downloaded on the website. And in terms of China's current plan in climate investment and finance, uh, the policy guidance document uh, are already been released last year. And the China is also working on how to pilot climate investment and finance at the city's level and uh, developing climate investment and finance standard. What does climate bond, climate loan, climate fund means? And, and also uh, uh, identify a key climate investment and finance projects for delivering NDC, National Determined Contribution Target. So I'm also involved in uh, developing training material for uh, uh, government and official as well as uh, business uh, sectors for climate investment and finance. And uh, remarkably in 2019, China established the Climate Investment and Finance Association, CIFA, which uh, now is actively facilitate uh, as climate investment and finance activities in, in the countries. And, and uh, uh, the government is also interesting to support uh, developing more local and international platform to facilitate uh, international collaboration. And, uh, and there is also academic article core activity to promote uh, more in low, low source in climate investment and finance. So in the future, uh, the works will be extended to risk management, carbon market derivative. There are a number of initiatives uh, considering a climate fund and also contribute to uh, international climate funds. So part of the policy di uh, guidance document, we talk about how China can uh, make the bearing road projects uh, uh, more climate friendly. So I'm here to uh, make an uh, invite for all of you to uh, mm -hmm. submit article to a major uh, article course on climate investment and successful uh, 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 authors being selected by the event will be funded to uh, travel to, to uh, China's major workshops on climate investment and finance uh, at the second half of this year. So hopefully by that time, COVID issue can be uh, clear. So this is a, will be a major event and there are 13 international and Chinese journal participating in the article call. So uh, let's have the final remarks for the, uh, this uh, guest lectures. Uh, so we cover a number of issues. So we need we, uh, uh, for climate finance, you need to assess climate finance need and effectiveness and need to consider standard alignment and, and the need to assess additionality, classify climate statistics and climate impacts. And we also need to develop innovative climate finance products and service managing different type of policy uh, and uh, tackle the climate risk issues and set up the long-term carbon price signal in corporate and, and potentially government can set up a guidance longer term carbon price for industry in the country. Uh, and thanks for your participation. And uh, this is an overview of climate investment and finance activity in China. Thank you so much, Xi, and uh, for this uh, marvelous um, uh, talk, really comprehensive about the, uh, the current uh, status of the climate uh, investment and finance and the, um, uh, the, the overview, the perspective, future perspective of uh, where they are looking at.
And please, uh, if anybody has a questions, uh, please put it in the uh, question and answer uh, box. And uh, then uh, we will collect the, your, your questions and then uh, make uh, available to, uh, uh, to Xiliang for answer. Uh, maybe let me just start with the first one. And in she, you, you talk about this uh, scope three, um, you know, the, uh, the emissions about uh, the potential carbon leakage that might be having uh, in the future. And then, you know, you, you, you were giving some uh, like a, um, a warning about this, uh, like, a, but in your mind, what should that the, the, the mechanism or the, uh, the, the, the collaborative um, platform or mechanism should be? To uh, to unplug this uh, uh, carbon leakage, uh, especially from the investment and financing uh, perspective. Yeah, so uh, it's a very important question. So internationally, there there is a need to develop a, a consensus and a, a common standard to tackle the scope three emissions and the emission leakage issue, as well as a a standard to tackle the double double counting issue of emission reduction or emissions. So, but in, and in the in the country, I think um, there is an urgent need to pilot how to assess scope emission three emission at the city level or district level because it's impossible to do the scope three emission at the national level for country scale like China because of lack of data experience and the standard. But but if we start to uh, pilot how to assess scope three emissions at a certain region or districts and try to develop a robust database to, uh, for scope three emissions. And ultimately we can get there to have a robust international and global system to tackle uh, uh, scope three emissions and the emission leakage to uh, other countries. And when, it, when we purchase a vehicle in China, we will know what will be the uh, scope three emissions of every piece of the vehicle and what will be the, the total scope three, scope three emissions of, and for, for the whole vehicle. Then and in that case, uh, uh, we will have a more robust outcomes to deliver the climate goals. Mm. Okay, uh, so, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And also related to that, um, the, the investors and uh, especially, well, China, uh, we will focus on China. There's a lot of investors in China and uh, they are, you know, they possibly will invest on the low carbon technology or, or let's say climate friendly uh, uh, technologies and platform. And then the, in the uh, UK or, or international investors, uh, do we have some, shall we treat them equally, uh, you know, from this, uh, uh, or like, um, how, how do we, uh, you know, this differentiates them, uh, especially when they enter into this uh, climate finance market? Yes, I, I, this is country. a good point. I, I think uh, Shenzhen has proposed to uh, make favorable policy for foreign uh, climate finance flow to, to pilot, uh, give a more favorable policy to uh, foreign climate, invest, climate friendly investors uh, flow into China. So it will be easier for international finance flow in and out of China uh, if they, they are targeting uh, climate friendly activities in the countries. So they, they, this is already part of the uh, current uh, 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 efforts in help to identify whether there's a way to uh, mobilize more international climate finance in, in the countries. Mm. And also it's a more broader question uh, your uh, thinking of the role of China in implementing um, climate finance uh, or like, uh, this uh, climate finance from uh, developed countries to uh, China and further to global south, even in India, like Africa. What, what's your ideas? Uh, you know, what's yeah. China's role and what's Chinese investors' role? Yeah, uh, uh, thanks China. for your question. I think there are a lot of uh, Attention and focus on climate invest, climate uh, carbon emission of Chinese Bell and Road uh, in, investment. So, um, in, in the climate investment and finance policy guidance document, it clearly outlines uh, uh, south south collaborations so between China and the developing country. It should encourage more climate friendly activities 
uh, and also uh, encourage uh, uh, Chinese industry to work with a, a, a OECD country, a rich country, to develop climate friendly infrastructure. So clearly, there need to be a consensus on how to tackle carbon emissions in uh, the least developed country and developing other developing country because of, uh, in the next three decades, more infrastructure will be built in uh, South Asia, Africa, and the Latin Americas. Okay, that's great. Let's move on to another question. Um, someone was asking, uh, you will discuss a lot of the additionality issue and uh, then what's the solution for that? And uh, he wants to know what's the solution for the additionality issue in, uh, I think he meant, uh, or he or she meant in the uh, uh, climate finance way. How do you avoid that basically? Yeah, so uh, without additionality, the fi climate finance product should be called a, a different name or a name clearly like statistic or climate friendly statistic. But with, if any financial product want to use public finance, concessional finance, or other uh, climate friendly concessional investment. So it should tackle the additionality because otherwise we waste public finance to crowd uh, commercial finance. Uh, so to tackle the issue, there needs to be uh, additionality need to be assessed. And clean development mechanism obviously is a failure in the assess uh, additionality. There, are, there have been already many studies cover this. So a robust frameworks and the methodology in assessing additionality uh, is latest. And also uh, the, the, we, uh, we should avoid the conflicts of interest in assessing additionality. So who is assessing additionality should not be the clients of the project investor and developer. And there should be an independent institute in every country or every region in assessing additionality and to tell investor whether your project is additional or not additional. So these are issues need to be tackled uh, if, if additionality needs to be taken seriously. Okay, that's, uh, that's good. Thank you. I hope the answer is, uh, it's, uh, is um, uh, satisfying to, to, the, uh, to the, uh, the guests. Uh, the second question is related to the carbon uh, peak and uh, the carbon neutral. Uh, in terms of the uh, timeline, and uh, she was think, asking, what, what, do you think the Chinese uh, target is um, a good one compared to the US, you know, the developed countries, especially European Union's uh, past the uh, experience? Do you think that is a reliable one or is it too conservative? And how do you how do you assess that? Yeah, uh, I believe uh, this is a, a, a ambitious target. It's a difficult and a tough target um, because China is still a developing country and still have many local priorities to tackle. While the, if you and also China is a very big manufacturing country. If you look at the emission per capita it, for a country like Germany, Japan, this large industry country. Um, is still quite high even after years of decarbonized effort. So for China, it's not going to be easy to achieve carbon neutrality by 2060. But the the, the president of the country have announced uh, have have highlighted the importance seven times in different location, and the chi China usually uh, will once it's commit to a target, they will try to achieve. So I am still confident, but it's not going to be an easy process. Mm. And, Okay, sounds sounds good. Our next question is that um, there's quite a few, so so we're gonna hold for maybe ten minutes late. I hope. Um, okay, next question is how do you consider financial mechanism could be used the most effectively to unlock private investment uh, in climate finance? Uh, so I think right now because of the, uh, the vested interest in the financial sector, so I don't think the expertise in the financial sector has been used to help climate mobilizing climate finance. And, and there's a need to uh, using more uh, to uh, uh, in, encourage financial experts in large banks and security firms, investment bank, they can try to help assess the uh, uh, risk and the return of climate friendly projects and to tell policy maker and what level of public finance or concessional finance 
could make this project some projects or originally unavailable to become available and also uh they, they and they also the financial sector need to uh structure different types different forms of climate finance and to optimize the existing uh, uh, uh funding available for climate finance and the third issue right now the financial sector is doing well is try to educate investor to uh to prefer invest more funding in climate finance. Yeah, that's uh, that's good. I hope uh, the uh, um, uh, the guys would, uh, would uh, like your answer. Uh, one uh, one more is um, the the MDB. I guess is a multilateral development bank is the most important part for the green financing, or possibly is in the uh, climate financing as well. So, what is the biggest barrier? to involve those uh, development, you know, multilateral development bank, in your opinion? Yeah, so uh, my multi-development investment bank is a very important intermediate to facilitate climate finance. And if you look at the statistic in the last five years, uh, a majority of climate finance international flow is going through multi uh, multilateral uh, development bank. And to make the best use of funding, and I think currently uh, there's still a lot of bureaucracy in uh, uh, transferring money from uh, countries to MDB and to actual projects. And usually it's a very lengthy process, a very long, uh, uh, very long pipeline to, to weigh. And it will be useful to improve the efficiency of funding projects and at the same time uh, to introduce more market based mechanism. Uh, to for MDB DB to uh, to maximize the effectiveness of climate investment and and uh, ultimately uh, donors governments need to understand the importance of I improving efficiency of climate finance. Okay, that's um, that's great. Yeah, we have uh, one more, maybe two more questions, and uh, yeah, so I think we were gonna take uh, these two. If there's no further, then uh, we will. Uh, close the, the session then. Um, okay, it's a very interesting question. Is you know the UN SDG, the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, does this uh, UN SDGs has a has a has a role in the um, in the climate finance and the investment? Or how do you see these things is uh, um, connected together? Yeah, I think UN, UN SDG is obviously important reference in formulating uh, climate friendly related standards and guidance. Uh, but UN SDG is much more uh, broader, cover much more broader areas than uh, climate finance. And in the, uh, uh, I, I, and I think uh, apart from UN SDG and I think EU has this kind of sustainable testimony, uh, which use a, 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 a reason, uh, 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 which take into account wider environmental impacts while you define a climate finance product. So I think we can use U UNSDG's uh, targets and as a potential uh, bottom line for climate finance products. So for example, while a project can generate climate fr friendly uh, uh, benefit, but, but at the same time, it shouldn't harm other environment or sustainability or poverty related issues. Hmm. Okay. That's um. That's very good. And he is asking the the the, the other one is uh, uh. Do you recommend the global reporting initiative as the most used ESG, uh, which I think is environmental sustainability goals, uh, report as a reporting mechanism for Chinese business? I think uh, if I correct me if I'm wrong. So I think what he asking is that. Uh, you know, when we do this um, uh, climate financing and investments, what will be the reporting mechanism? And uh, there's uh, some sort of a global reporting initiative uh, being used before. And what's your opinion on, on the reporting mechanism? Yeah, I think uh, GRI, Global Reporting Initiative, is a very good reference and used for ESG reporting. And and there will be uh, it will be useful to have uh, Common template for ESG reporting. Uh, this will help investor to identify the issue. Um, so, and and at the same time, it, it will really be helpful to have a further segmentation about the issue I just mentioned to uh, avoid greenwash for uh, in the ESG issues. 
Okay, that's good. Yeah. Um, okay, that's good. Okay, that's uh, very good. And uh, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Xi. And just really, uh, really rich for um, um, uh, presentation and the uh, question and answers. There's quite a lot of questions coming up from the uh, our audience. And uh, we really uh, appreciate your time and effort to put this together. I give to, I, I see a lot of our students in the UCL are attending this uh, seminar. I think this is a great, a great experience for them. Yeah, great. Thanks, Davo. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so okay. if um, that's okay, please allow, allow me to close this session. And uh, um, please uh, do pay attention to our uh, CPM sister seminar series. And uh, then we will have other, uh, like a, a, a distinguished guests to, to speak our on the online um, uh, seminar series. Thank you very much and see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.